Hey guys, welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks, and I have missed you guys. It has been way too long since we have been drinking and binking, and I'm so excited today. We have a very special guest. I've been waiting to have this guy on my show since before the show was even created, and I'm so excited to welcome in now CBS Sports analyst and former five-time NFL executive of the year. He won three Super Bowls with the New England Patriots, my friend Scott Pioli. Thank you so much for well, coming to be on the show here today. Thanks for having me, Julie. It's great. Finally, right? Know, How long did this take us? I know. Actually, before the show was even created, yeah. which I'm sure if anyone was listening to the idea of the show ahead of time, would be like, okay, I'll wait and see what this is like <laughs> before I agree to come on. But I know you've been very busy. Yeah. Um, you're in town now. You've been consulting with the NFL, but you've yeah. been also been doing a ton of different things since you yeah. left Atlanta. Too many things. May. Too many things. But that's awesome because that's what we love to talk about here. And before we get into all that, just got to ask you, we drink something on the show, whatever our guest wants. And what do we have here today? Straight black coffee. I'm not going to give the brand. Right, because no, we don't give away free hats. Yeah, if they're not sponsoring you, we're not. They're not getting the brand. Just so black mystery coffee. brand coffee, and that's great because, oh, I mean, I drink like a hundred cups a day, so I am excited to go. have you here. Let's do Cheers. This. Let's this take. Let's awkward. take a little taste test on this mystery brand. It's a little warm, not hot. Sorry, Danielle, our PA. I know you did a good job of getting this ready, but. <laughs> I requested room temperature. I only drink, you know, I, true fact, I only drink room temperature coffee or cold. You that is only true. do? I don't do hot. Yeah. Oh, okay, good, good. So this, oh, so, so this is perfect. actually, this is planned. This is, thank you, Danielle, <laughs> so much for this room temperature coffee that Scott specifically asked for. <laughs> I mean it. Um, no, I mean, that comes with sometimes being in the spotlight um, and the gig. And we got to know, what are you, what are we toasting to right now? Like, what's good in oh. the Scott Pioli life? Gosh, what's good? that I'm not traveling as much as I was in the previous weeks. Now, it's good for me. I'm happy about it, but you know, my 16 or our 16 year old daughter isn't real happy. She likes it when I'm on the road at this age. Oh yeah. She likes like it, dad's out of town. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I she, could Instagram as much as I want. Or she just, she's just like, shh, daddy, stop talking. So she just doesn't have to hear my voice. <laughs> well, the good thing about you being here is we want to hear your voice and all the different Thanks. stories and things you're working on. And one of the things I found interesting when I met you, Scott, we met at a wedding last year, yeah. our good friend Field Yates. And what a wedding yeah. it was in Nantucket. And um, one of the things when I first met you that really caught my eye and it really made me want to talk with you more was the fact that you have done so much with women's empowerment within the NFL, which I found unique because we don't see that from a lot of people. And you have hmm. uh, your, you know, your own charity, Scott Pioli and Family Fund for women coaches and scouts. And tell me about it. Like, how did this come to fruition? Well, it's funny. Um, I had this idea for, for a number of years, but really couldn't figure out, um, you know, Everyone needs an advocate. Everyone needs help when they first start out. And being in the football business, I started coming along across a lot of people who wanted, uh, women who wanted to be in football, wanted to be in sports. And one of the same stories I kept hearing over and over is they couldn't get their start because they couldn't afford it. They were getting started too late. So, you know, my wife and I talked about some, some different ideas and we had this idea that maybe at some point in time we would create a fund to help support, to supply grants for entry level uh, coaches and scouts, female coaches and scouts. And uh, I'm also a member of the board uh, for the Women's Sports P Foundation, right. Billie Jean King's organization. So go back to 2016, Katie Sowers, who everyone now knows about. Mm -hmm. um, Katie was actually our daughter's fifth grade basketball coach back in Kansas City, back in 2012, I want to say it was. And um, when I got to the Atlanta Falcons, we decided to hire Katie, and I hired her to be an intern within the personnel department. Part of the problem was she was in her late 20s. She had a full-time job paying over 50 grand a year. She had full-time benefits and a house payment and a car payment and a serious relationship. And the job that I could offer her was an entry-level job that paid only $10 an hour. So part of what went into the into that was uh, my wife and I decided to help her a little bit with some mm -hmm. of her you know shortcomings. This whole idea and Katie's real life 
you know, situation and circumstance was really the impetus behind us creating this. So what we've done now is we've created this, we endowed a fund at the Women's Sports Foundation. And this last, uh, I think it was November, we gave grants to three other women that are coaching, a woman who's coaching at Brown, uh, a woman at Dartmouth, actually Jennifer King, who right. was just named uh, an assistant coach at the Washington and um, Heather Marini, who's at Brown, and then also um, a young lady who's a scout, Sally Clavell. Her uncle was actually an NFL player for the Green Bay Packers. So all three of them received grants this year because, you, you know, in this industry, it's uh, everyone needs help. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the help very often goes to people that look like me, quite honestly. And we just thought that it would be a good idea to do something like this. I mean, it's it's fantastic, the work that you're doing with this. And I find it interesting that you say um, a hurdle was finances, because what I would think, you know, the hurdle would be gender. And why, why should a woman be given this opportunity? She didn't play. She didn't grow up being a football player. What do you say to people who kind of come back with that? Well, there's a couple of things. So the gender is the initial hurdle, right? There's a million hurdles. And that's the thing is when there's so many hurdles, you have to try to eliminate as many hurdles as possible. And the other thing is you have to do is eliminate excuses, not excuses for the individuals, but the excuses that other people are making to not hire women in sports and football, or maybe pigeonhole them into a certain role. So I think, you know, in, in the case of, again, I started at a very low level. When I started, um, and a lot of people look like me, we can find a lot of ways to um, get help. Whether, because we're not getting paid enough, you end up staying at someone's house. There's always someone reaching out with some kind of help. It's, it's either their time, their treasure, their talent. And again, this is, we could do this, for, this could be very long when we talk about it, but the, the bottom line is, um, women have never been allowed into the boys club, which is, not just sports, not just football, it's the world, right? And, and, and I wanna to touch on this too, because I know you were speaking about gender here, but the equality work that I do go, has to do with race, has to do with gender, it has to do with the gay and lesbian community. It's, it's all, um, all groups of people that are marginalized because I, I just go back to this whole thing that as I've gotten older and understood um, how blessed my life has been, which I knew at a very young age, watching my sisters and how mm -hmm. we had different, or they had very different challenges than I did. You know, um, when you grow up or you're born like this, you know, you wake up on, or you're born on third base and you've got a head start and someone like you is at a disadvantage for no reason whatsoever, right? I mean, I, I came out and I hit the lotto. Right. right. So it, there's something just fundamentally wrong and unfair about that, that someone just because I'm a white male, that I should have this access, this proximity and this, again, access to power for nothing that I did or earned. So then how do you sort of see those see that? Because a lot of people that look like you can still go down continue on with life and not sort of have that realization. Yeah. So what, maybe what was the tipping point for you in, in realizing what you could do? There, there, there are two things that really impacted my life. Um, and first, it first happened, it had to do with race. Um, I was seven years old, going into third grade, and uh, my school teacher, Miss Cooper, who's now Mrs. Jackson, I still stay in touch with her. She's one of my uh, dear, dear friends. She was the first uh, black school teacher in our school district and at seven years old you're hearing things in the community from adults there were a lot of adults who resisted that a, a there should be a black school teacher even worse she was a black woman <clears throat> and as a seven-year-old child you're hearing all these things about what this person is going to be like right and we're still in this formative stage in life where we don't see color as much we only start seeing color when adults are telling us about color or some of our contemporaries contemporaries who have been taught by their parents or their the adults in their life that wow that person looks different so they should be different when it's not really true mm -hmm. and and the short version of the story julie is that um you know, you find out in August who your teacher's gonna be, so you've got these couple of weeks leading up to it, and I'm hearing all these things, not only in my own home, but everywhere in the neighborhood about what Miss Cooper's gonna be like. And at seven years old, you know, you're hearing these words that I will not say on air, um, descriptors, just, just these, these horribly racist things, 
and the anxiety I remember having that first morning because I had no idea. There's this kid's book, it's got the, you know, the, the monster, the monster under the bed. You mm -hmm. think you're gonna go there and see this monster when you go to school? And this woman, Miss Cooper, greeted every single child that was going into her class. You know, we all had to line up in these lines <clears throat> and hugged every single one of us. And for that entire year, there was this narrative that you're hearing as a child, but every single day when we went into the classroom, and it wasn't just myself, Miss Cooper had a hug, a touch, a feel, a physical, um, and I don't mean it's, a, it's, a, it's crazy that I have to hesitate to say it. No, <laughs> I, I understand She has this mean. physical intimacy right. and, and closeness with children that she doesn't even know that are the children of the people that are making her life so difficult. Mm. And there's real confusion in that. So I, I think that was one of those moments when I first started to realize how wrong adults could be. And I was able to formulate this whole different opinion. And this woman did nothing but, but love every single kid in that class every single day. And she was brilliant, she was amazing, and she's still an amazing friend. Mm -hmm. um, She's down in D.C. now, and she came to a game a couple of years ago when I was Oh, that's was incredible. Down. Yeah, yeah. But a so realization she, for you at a very young age about stereotypes and yeah. about uh, misconceptions, and you're doing a lot of work right now, which we definitely want to get into more, but we have to take a quick time out on Drinks with Thanks. Stay tuned. Welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB, and we have Scott Pioli, who is an analyst for CBS Sports, five-time NFL Executive of the Year, won three Super Bowls with the Patriots, has done so many different things in his life. And right now, one of the avenues we were just discussing before the commercial break was what he's been doing in diversifying the NFL in the front offices and the coaches that are involved with more women. We talked about Katie Sowers, who was the first female and openly gay coach to coach in the Super Bowl, as well as Jennifer King, who was just hired by the Washington and so both of these women have you at least in part in their background of their journey to get to this point and I you know I I, I was shocked when I when I met you because I was like I've never met an executive in broadcasting in anywhere in NFL that really wanted to help women at this level and you know minorities and everything and like how do your peers feel like are you do you find other guys you work with are like this or it's, it's no? mixed but i'll say this julia you know i'm not a unicorn in this you know i think like it's interesting because you just found out about me and the work that i've done i, I can say this i know that there's a there are a number of other people not just in football but in other sports that do this work and it's sometimes um it's complicated Right, because of the reaction that you get sometimes from people that you have to, um, I've never talked about it. My story in doing this work only started coming out when people that I've helped and mentored and and advocated for started telling the story, right? Um, so I think most of the people that I know that do this work and are involved in it are similar to me in the sense that you don't do the work because it it's part of your platform or that it's part of your, um, you know, there, there's people I, I do see out there now that are trying to make it part of their platform, trying to make, you know, it, it somehow now in these, it, today, it makes people look better. But um, there's a lot, I think there are far more people um, beyond myself. I, in fact, I know it because, you know, I, I just, this story, uh, uh, you know, a few days ago that came out of um, Juliana Klein, who's the daughter of one of my dearest childhood friends who, you know, I helped, but I really didn't help um, get a job in baseball. Um, one of my dearest friends is Mark Shapiro, the president and general manager of the Toronto Blue Jays. Mark is one of my longest, dearest friends. Um, he helped get Juliana a job, an entry level job in training camp. I mean, spring training. And he's advocated for her and helped her move along. And no one knows Mark's story and how many people he's helped. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, I don't, th I really don't think I'm that unique. But it does, it, you ask about the dynamic, how it is with some of my peers and my contemporaries. Some people support it and many others don't. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's okay because I think, I think we know that, right? I don't think people wear that on their, you know, on their chest, on which side they're on and what they believe in. But um, it's, it, there have been times where it's been fully supported. And there's been people like, 
at the Falcons when we brought um, Katie in to work as a Bill Walsh coach for four weeks before I hired her as a 10 month intern, you know, Dan Quinn accepted that. That was his coaching staff. He had the right to say yes or no, and Dan accepted that. He wanted to understand it and what some of the um, some of the dynamics might be that that people are afraid of or that he was afraid of. And that's the funny thing is in this work, I think people worry about and think about possibilities that 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 are just overblown. Like what? Um, the the difference in the genders, right? The simple fact. How many we've heard our whole lives that men and women can't be friends, men and women can't work together without there being something right that doesn't become inappropriate, and and that it, it's just not accurate or true. Do you think and I think that element is very strong in those circles. I don't know if it's strong is as much as I think. Julie, that there's um, there's a fear. Mm -hmm. I think there's a fear of the unknown because people hear certain stories, and as we know, it's like the game of telephone. There's this story, and then each generation that right. story makes it even bigger or worse or blows it out of proportion from what the truth is. And I think people um, people are afraid of things that they shouldn't be. Do you afraid think that of. people would be more afraid of women based on everything that's happened with the Me Too movement? I think some people are. I think some people are, unfortunately, but, you know, get over it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Get over it. Just because one of the rules and the, and the things that I talk about um, in, in the work that I do is do this work and do it unconditionally. And not, and again, with gender, with race, with, with any community of marginalized people that you're going to do this work, make sure the work is unconditional. Unconditional means totally unconditional in every sense. Don't make, don't do it because it's going to, again, platform you. Right. Or to, make you look good yeah, or that, that's any not, kind of accolades. Do it because of the, the truth, which is A, it's the right thing and, you know, B, it's it makes you better. It makes groups better when there are more thoughts, more ideas, more perspectives, because the, the, the fact is we think differently, right? Because of the way that we've been raised, mm -hmm. because of the society norms um, that have created this, this thing between genders, we come at things with different biases and different thoughts and different perspectives. And when you co-mingle those things, you actually come to a better place with better ideas and more thought that eventually becomes a pretty good business model. Right. I, mean, I hate hearing that whole thing about the business model, but it but there's truth no, it to is, that. No, it is part of that. And, you know, your your answers and your 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 ideas are so thoughtful. I'm surprised because like I've had so many very strong female role models in my life that would that would be championing the exact same cause as you are, but having males do it is unique. And I just have to, I'm just wondering why, like what, I know, you know, you can say this is the right thing in this, but why for you, Scott, are you so passionate? Well, the why part is really important. You know, I know I just told the story about Miss Cooper, but also, you know, when I was growing up, um, so I, I graduated high school in 1983. I have two sisters that are older than me, two sisters that are truly growing up um, and probably even now, were better than me in every way imaginable. They were better athletes, they were better students, they were certainly better behaved. Um, they didn't get into a fraction of the trouble that I got into. Um, and, you know, both played varsity soccer for years, but, you know, my oldest sister, Laura, graduated high school in 1977. Now, Title IX at that point in time is five years old. And Title IX is this thing, but there's no real juice behind it. I mean, the the acceptance rates in college, acceptance rate in colleges is less for females than it is males. The availability of financial aid for females is less than males. These are things that we don't talk about that were actually happening back then. And I have another sister who's, you know, just a, a couple of years later, um, pretty much the same resume. I mean, dominant soccer players that probably today could have been scholarship athletes and again, tremendous students. And I come along a couple of years later and because I've got an extra piece of the anatomy and I can play football, my life trajectory completely changes because I go to college to play football and I get a football scholarship. My family, because of the socioeconomic situation we were in and because of financial aid demands, my sisters couldn't go to college. Now, they also, from that point, you know, after they graduated high school, they became mothers pretty quickly. Um, and people say, you know, and, and one of the most frustrating things to me, and I'll try to keep my composure on this, is I hear people say, well, you know what? Your sisters made decisions. They, they made their choices. That's what they decided to do. And it really angers me because the, 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 the truth is 
they didn't have the opportunity to dream like I did. I knew there was an opportunity to to change the trajectory of my life, my family's life, by going off to college because I could play football. Because I was a white dude, I had chances to do things that they couldn't do. My sisters didn't even have the ability to dream like I did. They saw this much smaller box. And when you grow up um, and you see that, now, honestly, I don't think I was that aware at 16. I knew something was wrong fundamentally, but when you're, I wasn't that advanced. I wasn't that in touch with reality. But, um, you know, being raised uh, Catholic, you know, that good old fashioned Catholic guilt kind of kicks mm -hmm. in, you know, something lingering in the back. And, and, and I realized over life, I, I, I never, and, and the moment came at one point in time in college, I, I was talking with a buddy who said that exact thing to me. And they're like, Scott, hey, Scott, you know, your sisters made their choices. And I started dropping F-bombs because like, no, they didn't have choices. So I, and I know I'm getting a little worked up here, no, but, I like but it. This, I... is, this, is, this is the truth. I mean, and there's something so fundamentally wrong with the whole idea that, that I have... I can dream better and differently and have better access, have de better proximity to power and opportunities than my own flesh and blood, my sisters, again, who started out and were better than me in every way imaginable. There's just something wrong with that, Julie. Well, because of your experiences, you're already seeing growth for women in the NFL, which has got to feel pretty good seeing just like even just small gains in terms of yeah. this. And this is going to go down in history because you're already doing this. You're changing people's minds. You're opening them up to understanding that women can be in these roles. And especially for someone who works in a male dominated industry, you know, we've always been thought of as sort of, you have to know twice as much as any man to have this job, or you know, you only are on the sideline, different things like that. And so I definitely feel passionate and, and understand where you're coming from with that. And I definitely want to get into a whole lot more with Scott Pioli, who is incredible incredible on drinks with things. Hey guys, welcome back to Drinks with Thinks. I'm JSB, and we are excited today. We have Scott Pioli here. He's an analyst for CBS Sports, doing lots of things in media these days, as well as helping empower those who have a lesser voice in the NFL and beyond. And he's done so much within the league for so many different teams and won three Super Bowls, been to five Super Bowls, and you're a good guy, too. And there's a couple other good guys in the league that are... Yeah paving the way as we see more women and we're trying to also get more black coaches in the league Absolutely. as well because that helps especially within our political climate as well and what everything that's going on but tell me who what have you seen in terms of let's spin this forward what's what's going on in well the league? I, you know i think there's a you know we've been talking about me and i want to make sure we acknowledge there's a, a, there are a lot of other people out there that care about this work because it, it does become work. I mean, I look at what Sean McDermott's done in the time that he's been a head coach, the number of, of women coaches he's had. Um, he's had one uh, a female coach each of the last two years. Bruce Arians, the job he's doing down there. You know, I know um, Mike Vrabel, Brian Flores. There's a bunch of other coaches out there that are going to be making. Kyle Shanahan. I mean, there's – so, again, I don't think it's it, it's that unique mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Uh, you know, it's it's – there are opportunities out there and coaches are now seizing and, and there's some front office people that are doing it so i think that there's a there's a lot of people that understand this because there's a new thought um or a new generation that thinks a little bit differently than older generations right. and and they're more willing to understand what the truth is mm -hmm. so um yeah it, it's uh, there, there's, there's a number of people i know that um andrew berry who's just named the head yes. uh, the, the general manager of the cleveland browns you know andrew and i've been talking i know a lot of the stuff that he's going to be doing he made it public that the, he's going to be doing a lot of diverse hiring and um th they're all people that i have a lot of respect for and re I'm really proud of. I know Howie Roseman's done it down at the Philadelphia Eagles. So there's um, there's a lot of change happening around the league, and I just hope that you know one thing about the game of football. It always seems like um, 
the the game in the NFL itself ha gives it is this platform for people to see things and maybe the good and the bad, right? Mm -hmm. This is one of the things I think they'll be able to see and say, "Wow, that is pretty normal. Why don't we try that in whatever our industry is?" So, mm -hmm. so there, there's a lot of people out there doing good things, Julie. Yeah, well, it does set the tone for many other industries in the world, as you mentioned, and it's great to see when people see something that they haven't seen before. It normalizes it and shows what an added benefit someone who looks different from them can be to an organization. And you've worked with many different organizations. Yeah. And one of them I, I have to ask you about because you had so much success was with New England. Yeah. And we have seen this be such a dynasty with Bill Belichick yeah. and Tom Brady. And having been on the inside, what is it about the DNA of this mm. NFL team that has made it so successful? You know, um, it's interesting because, you know, Bill and I had worked together for years prior to that. We worked together in Cleveland at the Browns, and then we had a year apart, and then the next three years at the New York Jets. And I remember a lot of the conversations and some of the things that were important to both of us and really that family that we created in New England uh, when, when everything started. And the, the, the thing is, it's a big part of it, Julie, is that, first of all, Bill is the greatest coach that's ever coached the game uh, on every level. Tommy is the greatest quarterback that's ever played. Even though I'm, I'm a, I, I don't agree with comparing people across generations. Um, but I think part of what, what made the Patriots thing different was the simplicity of it. And, and it started with Bill's three basic rules, the same rules that he had when he was Cleveland in Cleveland, which was, and these rules applied to every staff member, every coach, scout and especially players. Be on time, pay attention, work hard. Off of those three very simple principles manifest all of these other things. For instance, being on time, paying attention, work hard. What does that come down to? That comes down to being accountable, being responsible, being responsible not only for yourself, but how that will manifests itself in our relationship, mm -hmm. right? If I'm on time, paying attention, working hard, that means I'm not only doing it for myself, I'm doing it for you. And I think everything that the that, that program was built on had everything to do with that. We focused on winning championships, not any of the fruits that came with winning championships, but staying in the moment and chasing the next championship. So everything we always did was all about winning and trying to win with the right kind of people. And w when, when you strip it all down, um, yes, Bill is the greatest coach of all time. Tommy's, again, the greatest quarterback of all time, in my opinion. The, 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 the part that bothers me about that is the number of really, really, really good players that were there and other good coaches that were there that at sometimes I think people forget about, oh yeah, he was there. I mean, Mike Vrabel was a great player. And, and I don't use the word great very often. He was a great player. You know, Willie McGinnis was a terrific player. Ty Law. There were so many other players that played their roles, that whole idea of just do your job. Mm -hmm. um, there were so many people that came through that system that were selfless and just did their job. People forget, again, what the beginning was like. Those first three Super Bowls in four years, when we had people like Troy Brown, who was a receiver, but near the decline of his career, was playing corner. You know, he, he was right, playing so. two ways. All of these people that were so selfless, all that they did, the, everything that they did, everyone, players, coaches, myself, everyone, scouting staff, was for this greater good and focused on the greater good. A model of success, for sure. And I know you've seen many other different teams that haven't had that kind of DNA. You told me before we came on air that Tom is like one of the most yeah. special people you've ever met, which a lot of people would be like, I don't believe that. But what what's how would you describe Tom? Like, what's the biggest misconception that we wouldn't understand about he him? He is as um, he has this these dualities of his personality. He is one of the most competitive aggressively competitive people I've ever been around, yet he's one of the most gentle and empathetic people I've ever been around. He has, again, these duality. The, 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 you, you mentioned these things, that, or I would mention these things about him that sound like complete contradictions and things that wouldn't go together. Um, you know, not too many guys like the idea of being called sweet. Tommy is truly one of the sweetest human beings I've ever met. He, he's, uh, I, I always go back to the beginning and meeting him in, in 2000 when we had him. Um, 
you know, here's a guy who had three older sisters who were all athletes and growing up from what I heard, they were all better athletes until he became an NFL player and he had mm -hmm. some success. Um, you know, for, for a couple of years there, he was Boston's most eligible bachelor and he was living with two of his older sisters. Um, he's an incredible family man. He loves his parents. He loves his siblings. Again, he's, and yet the, the, the Tom that people see, they see this guy, Tom Brady, to me, he's Tommy because when you see him now, you see him in these competitive situations. You see all of these people that want to tear him down because, mm -hmm. quite honestly, you know this is this is part of what we love to do in this country. We love to see people come from nothing, become incredibly successful, and then we love to r try to rip him to shreds uh, publicly. And he um, he has one of the kindest spirits and souls, and authentically just a good human being that is so aware. Um, I, I could go on all day because yeah, there's so many things about could. him. He, he's just, he's a remarkable human being. Well, we have more time to talk about him when we come back after this time out. We'll be back with more on Drinks With Thanks. All right, guys, welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB. We've got Scott Pioli here, NFL executive, five-time NFL executive of the year. We were just talking about the Patriots, and I would be remiss not to ask you about the fact that you're just talking about Tom Brady. You negotiated with him in 2005. You have a great relationship with him. He's entering free agency now. He's 40. He's going to be 43 this year. <laughs> he's unbelievable. He's won so many Super Bowls, and he still has – seemingly a lot left in the tank what do you think happens wow i don't know just to back up i did not negotiate that contract with him he started negotiating with me because that would be illegal oh, you have okay. to work through the agent so i, I want to clear that i want i don't want to get you handcuffed <laughs> well, here scott well, i can't i can't get called to the commissioner's office anymore because you know I'm you're helping him out <laughs> to be honest yeah um what's gonna happen with Tom? you know i don't know and it's it's so funny every day um, I open up the internet and there's this new story and I'm watching how many people are getting traction out of Tommy's life and his story and like when that silly picture th that came right. out. It was great for Hulu. It, it was great, but it's just so funny how every last thing is put under the microscope and how much people want to speculate. It's honestly, when I was on the other side, meaning not doing media stuff, but when I was on the football side, this is the kind of stuff that drove you crazy when you were with a club because, and it, it, not only as an executive or a head coach or, or an assistant coach or the player because, or, or as a player too, because no matter what Tommy does, people are looking at it, it's a sign. You know, he, he's doing something and not everything, you know, it, it, it's not everything in life is a sign. Not everything in life is a um, is showing a hint into what you might be doing. Honestly, I don't know. He and I have had we've been in touch. We've had conversations. And you know how this with, with certain friends, you just know certain places you don't need of to course. go unless they want to talk about it. He knows that I'm willing to talk about it if I, if I want or if he wants. But um, I've, I've said this before. I don't care what he does. I just want him to be happy. I want him to be happy. I want his family to be happy. Truthfully, I want the Patriots to be happy. I want Bill to be happy. I want the and I don't know if that all comes together, and and having been a part of that organization for as long as I was, and and working with Bill for 17 years, this could be a done deal. Already that he's staying there, and they're just not, they just haven't done it yet. But so, isn't it that he is entering free agency? Even Robert Kraft he, said he's going to. But uh, to me, what I see this whole entering free agency thing about again, this is me speculating, yeah, right? Now. Of course. I don't like when people speculate. But to me, I think this is just the greatest sign of respect that all parties can have for one another, because Tommy's never been a free agent, right? He well, one of the stories has been. Please don't franchise me. Don't franchise me. Sometimes in life, people just need to lay down their arms. And my instincts tell me that everyone's just laying down their arms here. Because if the Patriots put the franchise tag on him, is that the way to treat Tom Brady and his 20 years? I don't think so. 
I don't think so. And I don't think that's who Robert Kraft is. I don't think that's who Jonathan Kraft is. I don't think that's who Bill is. So I truthfully think, yeah, he's going to free agency. People are making a big deal of it. But to me, it, it's more like it, it, it's a it's an olive branch of sorts. Hey, yeah, we would have the right to do this. Just go there and we'll get this figured out. Because I really believe deep down inside, um, and I, again, this is me speculating, just knowing the person that he is, that he doesn't want to be somewhere else. I, I, I don't think so. And again, I don't know anything. This is me just mm -hmm. talking about. Well, you've, you've got to know him for many mm -hmm. years, and you you know you've spoken very highly of him. Do you see him in a Patriots jersey next year? I hope to. You know, I I don't. I'm not. I don't think I'm in a position to say that I predict this is going to happen. I hope I do. But as soon as I say that, I just hope he's happy. I hope he's happy. I hope his family's happy. And again, I want the Patriots people to be happy too. I hope that they're all happy. <laughs> you, yeah, and I mean that sincerely. And, and because that's the way sometimes in life it would be beautiful. You know, it's beautiful to see things end in a storybook fashion sometimes. And I think that's, that would, that's what it would be if he stayed there. It would be strange even as a non-Patriots fan to see him anywhere else at the end of his career and watching many different talking heads I say a lot of guys ended up their career somewhere else because they were pushed out of where they were yeah and, and we we all get reminded time and time again that this is a business we get it it's a business and it is a business it would be nice just one time on a major scale to see something not end as you know being just business but that is the antithesis of the patriots then right <laughs> <laughs> we, we did business see i always saw that through a different prism okay and and i think bill did i shouldn't speak for bill but it wasn't about business it was about an obligation we had an obligation to every player on that roster every employee in that building every fan that paid all of our salaries to make decisions that, again, I don't like business decisions, to make sure that we put the best roster out there every single time. Not the best talent, but the best team and roster and collection of players that can win games. And you did that very well. And we're gonna discuss, discuss more about that when we come back <laughs> on Drinks With Thanks with Scott Pioli. Hey guys, welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. We've got Scott Pioli on the couch here with us, CBS Sports Analyst, five-time NFL Executive of the Year, won three Super Bowls with the Patriots, and you were with a number of other teams. One of them just won the Super Bowl, Kansas City Chiefs, and your time there was a little bit different from yeah. the time that you were with the Patriots. When you look back on it, especially seeing them get success, how would you describe that time? Well. Seeing them have success was actually, it was, it was cool. It was heartwarming. You know, I, I had turned down another, a number of GM jobs prior to taking that job. Um, that was one of the jobs in the league that, that always stood apart to me in a good way. The Hunt family, the Chiefs, the AFL, that whole, you know, growing up when I did, those great Chiefs players and teams, all those Hall of Famers. Um, I, I'm a real sap when it comes to, like, the history of the league. Um, the The... It was it was a interesting four years, you know, went out there with a lot of um, hopes, desires, worked my butt off for four years. You know, we ha started to get it turned by, our, you know, our second year. We we went from being a two and 14 team um, prior to me taking it over. Two years later, we were 10 and six, mm -hmm. won the division, went to the playoffs. And then two years later, we were back to two and 14 and uh, I was on my way out the door. And it's, uh, again, this is another whole show that we would have to do Yeah, on the well, we're going to have yeah. to have you back because we need more room temperature coffee. But <laughs> when you were on the way out, you interviewed Andy Reid, though. Yeah, yeah. So we, um, you know, what happened at the end of that season, that there was a, obviously a lot of things went on. We were 2-14, and 14, the season ended 2-14. and 14. Uh, In December, early December, we had the, the Javon Belcher um, murder suicide tragedy there was a lot going on and a lot of a lot of moving parts uh, however I was the you know the general manager and we decided to part ways with Romeo Cornell so that was the second head coach that I had fired and um, hired and then parted ways with and as soon as Andy became available because he was fired that year by mm -hmm. the Eagles 
you know, I felt very strongly and told Clark Hunt, this is the person that needs to lead this organization. This is the head coach. Mark Donovan, who was the president with the with the Chiefs at the time working uh, that I was working with, had worked with Andy in Philadelphia and he knew Andy very well. I, Andy and I were good personal friends. He was the right person for the right job. And even retrospectively, for all that went on in those four years and is tumultuous and is crazy for so many reasons, um, Andy was probably the best and the only person to take that team over. So after we, you know, we interviewed Andy and we decided to part ways, or I decided to part ways, and Andy took over. Uh, several weeks later, I think they hired John Dorsey. I can't remember how many weeks later, but um, Andy was a perfect person for that job, for all of the work that needed to be done and the healing that needed to happen. Um, and okay, so I have two two questions I want to go here with this. Um, you mentioned the healing right then, mm -hmm. and you you know you mentioned Javon Belcher, and you know it's really has to have been one of the worst experiences to have yeah. gone through that. Now that time has passed, what role has that incident played in your life when you were there when Javon Belcher wow. committed suicide? Um, well, before he committed suicide, here, here's the this is this is the interesting thing, Julie. Um, before he committed suicide, he was a murderer and it was domestic violence. So it was m more complicated than, uh, than s just suicide, I'd say the word just. Um, it was very complex. Um, I, it's, it's still something I don't get my head around totally. Um, you know, I don't wish it, I, I, I can't, having been standing from, you know, and watching the whole thing unfold and trying to, it's, um, it's something that never leaves you. Um, yeah, so it's it, it's still there, and I don't think about it or talk about it a whole lot. I just try to process it when I have to do it on my own Did time. you go to therapy after that? Uh, I don't know if it was official therapy, but, um, yeah, there was some people I had to talk to. pretty traumatic to witness. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, um, you think you can, you know, you never think you're going to see that. And when you actually see it, it's nothing like the movies, I'll tell you that. Yes, I can imagine. And I won't go into any more details on Truthfully, that, obviously. you can't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. You had another question um, about Kansas City. See, I'm good at, it, I'm good at transitioning out of that. I'm not that, that. evidently <laughs> very good at that, even though that is my job. Uh, <laughs> but also at the time that you interviewed Andy Reid, did you know that that was your end? No, no. And, and I wasn't sure I wanted to be, but there was just something that went on. This was supposed to be a couple of hour interview um, in a... Uh, in a private airport in Philadelphia, and it turned into this hours long meeting and a lot of discussions about a lot of things. And um, no, I, and, and it was, um, it was a long discussion. It wasn't your, it wasn't the, the public's perception of what went down in that meeting. And again, without getting into the details, I just also knew that it was time for me to go. Mm -hmm. It was one of those moments when um, the promise that I made when I got there and took that job and took that chair was that I was going to leave that leave Kansas City better than I had found it. Mm -hmm. We weren't better at that point in time, but I knew that hiring Andy had put it in a better place for, for all the two and 14 for all right. of the um, there were a lot of things that had to be done with that organization after it had, had you know 20 plus years of leadership under different people um, things that I know that internally the world will never see that were better but the bottom line is what people care about is the record and the record was what the record was we were two and 14 so I just knew there were so many conversations and deep conversations that went on during that interview um, that I realized it was time for me to go. Right. Well, you left and you hired the guy that took them to the Super Bowl this yeah. year. And there are a number of players that you worked with that ended up winning a Super Bowl as well. So we are not done yet. We got to take a quick break, but we'll be back with more on Drinks with Thanks. Hey guys, Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB. We've got Scott Pioli on the couch. We've discussed so many different things right now. And you have such a unique background. We have want to talk to you so much more. 
you are married to Dallas Parcells, Bill Parcells. Well, I guess Dal maybe she changed her name to your last name, but I gave her the option to keep her old last I name. I knew it. You're a Renaissance man. No, I, I, I love mean, it. I, I just don't understand. Like, if you're if you're a woman, you go through your entire life and then change it. We'll discuss that yeah, on the next a, episode the next show, of JS but yes. Drinks. But okay, what's what's one word to describe be, having Bill Parcells as your father-in-law? Wow, it's it's normal. No, it's not. <laughs> he's he's a he, he's a father-in-law. I mean, he was my boss yeah, for a little while, for but only for a year. Yes, yeah, it's it's, it's normal. I mean, he's uh, come on. I mean, how many celebrities or or people? We're not do you know, talking about they're just normal. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought we oh, is that a rule here on the right, show? We yeah. can't <laughs> ask a question back. No, he's a he's a father-in-law. I mean, okay. he's yeah. It's it's just. What's and, the most um, sage piece of, of advice that he's given you. Oh, he's given a lot. Um, oh my gosh. One, um, I mean, being that we just got off the Kansas city thing, I remember before I took that, um, that job, he reminded me of the same thing he told me when Bill and I went to the Patriots, even though there was a little friction going on, he was still, he wasn't being nice to Bill, but he was being nice to me. I guess he kind of had to, but he said, just remember when you get into that GM role, um, and it, it, even though I wasn't the GM in New England, it's kind of in that role. He says, every single day there's going to be at least five things that come up that are major crises that you did not plan for. And I remember when we first went to New England and then when I first went to Kansas City, because that's when the there's major crises going mm -hmm. on and because you're changing so much. And I remember calling back and saying, Bill, I wish it was only five. Yeah, because and, and, and he said, so just understand you're never going to get through your to do list. I mean, uh, seriously, there's a million things I could give you. That he I wish we will. Ha we'll do a full Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick. <laughs> no, we won't. 30 for 30 <laughs> drinks of things. Well, more after the break. <laughs> We've had a great time drinking and binking with Scott Pioli. And before you go, will you work with an NFL team again, like hmm. in a general manager format? I might. It depends. Right. It doesn't matter what I want to do. It matters if someone wants me. That's the way life is. But I'll tell you this. You know, our daughter is a junior in high school, so she's got a year and a half left. So I'm not leaving Atlanta for at least a year and a half. So, okay. you know. We'll see what happens. So if NFL team out there, Scott Pioli does want to be your general manager, <laughs> confirmed on drink. So thanks. Thank you so much for joining see, us. See, I twisted that. Today. <laughs> That's the media, baby. We know you work in the media as well. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you check us out on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, at Fubo Sports, as well as our esteemed guest, at Scott Pioli 51 and me, at JSB underscore TV. And until next time, keep on drinking and banking wherever you may be.